microphones for EVH Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones, and official Van Halen merchandise is provided by VanHalenStore.com. Now, here's your host from Ontario, Canada, EVH Gear artist Eric Broadbent. Hey Eric, thanks. Hey, thanks for having me on in the first place. It's it's an honor and it's always great to talk to a fellow Van Halen fan. I was very young when I first heard the the uh, first Van Halen record. I was hanging out with a bunch of older kids in the neighborhood that were a couple years older, and I remember it was whatever it was in '78 when I heard it, and the first thing I heard was "Running with the Devil," those opening chords, and I just I knew, even though I was only 12 years old or whatever it was, that it was special. And it was a lot different than the ACDC and Aerosmith records that I was listening to before I heard that record. Eddie, just his tracks just popped right off. And then it went into eruption. And then from that point on, it was like, holy shit, what is this guy doing? And who is he? And I got that Van Halen record. And from that point on, he was just my guy, and everyone else just paled in comparison. He was so fresh and inspired, and and he had so many signature isms to his playing that no one else was doing, and you could just totally tell it was him whenever he played, and that was so attractive to me as a musician, and even as a, on a keyboard player, I try to capture that kind of inspiration and uniqueness and try to integrate that into my style or as much as possible from a very early age. And I think compared to, you know, most of the keyboard players in rock, I'm totally, I have a total signature sound and you can totally tell it's me and you can hear my influence from Ed Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, Ingve, all of the great guitar players from that era. But, Van Halen was the one who sparked it from the beginning. I, I love it. And I like the fact that you said uh, running with the devil because myself, I came into Van Halen much later. I discovered them through uh, Women and Children First and The Cradle Will Rock. And to this day, it's not my favorite song anymore. And I really wish it was my favorite song from Van Halen. Um, it's not, mm -hmm. but I'm very, very thankful to that track because that's what made me discover. But I like the fact that you came in right off the hop with the very first track on the very first album. And you had so I much. Was in on the ground, I was in on the ground floor. And to me, it was my band. It wasn't my uh, older cousin's band. It wasn't the older neighbors, uh, Led Zeppelin. You know, this was my fucking band from the ground floor. And then at that point on, I'd listen to guys like Jimmy Page and all those Yardbird guys, and they all sounded like old farts, and their tone sounded crummy, <laughs> distortion compared to, like, fucking uh, On Fire and, and Eddie's playing. Eddie just it smoked circles around him from my, you know, perspective at that age so i was all about van halen even though they didn't have a keyboard player it was just the spirit of the the music and the presentation you know with roth and and michael anthony's background vocals and alex complimented the songs perfectly and had rough edges and it was just fucking awesome man to this day that those records still stand up the first uh the first six they certainly do they they certainly do and and I, I do hear and the world hears a lot of Eddie Van Halen you close your eyes and you listen to you play and uh, it's it, if they don't get Eddie Van Halen right away there's something they're, they're saying to themselves what is it about his sound it's it's they know they've heard it somewhere you know and it has a lot of Eddie Van Halen's the kind of DNA it's I guess spirit. It's, it's a spirit and it's a uh, it's just an approach. It's a um, aggressive. It's a command of the instrument and and an approach. And he was just. Uh, I, he's my favorite musician. I think he's great. I love it. I love it. He's really inspired us all for sure. And and it's one of those things where he's he's inspired not only musicians. He's inspired manufacturers from guitars to amplifiers to the toys to the pedals to anything that's technology. You know, technological technological in between. Um, he, there's a lot of people working today because of that man. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, Zach Wilde and I are really good friends, and we, we have this conversation, you know, dozens of times over the last 30 years about 
the great guitar players. And, you know, the bottom line is Hendrix came out and did what he did, and he's, you know, like the holy grail. But then you got Van Halen. As far as game changers go, Eddie Van Halen, after Hendrix, is the guy. And for all the reasons you mentioned, not only just the playing, but his innovations on the guitar, like everyone all of a sudden had this single uh, humbuckler on their Strat, and then everyone started playing graphics and, and doing things and just re-approaching rock guitar, and he really changed the game. The, the world would be a totally different place today, uh, the world and the music world especially. Uh, we'd probably have different guitars. Uh, it would be you know different sounds, so there's a lot of uh, um, respect uh, owed or, you know, to that man for sure. Here's something that we're going to get into actually talking about some uh, performances that you've done yourself. Uh, you've recorded some nice tributes to Eddie himself, including versions of Spanish Fly and Mean Street uh, on piano. Uh, I think that left a lot of us in witness. A lot of us that witnessed the videos uh, were kind of in shock, myself included. It's kind of like, what am I witnessing here? Were either of those songs hard to learn on the piano, or did they come naturally to you? No, they were difficult. Like to work up some of those piano passages. Uh, I mean, there's no way to duplicate it exactly how he's playing it on guitar because it's a different instrument and the picking. I can only do so much articulation, but the main passages, like those triplets on the end, they're not forgiving at all, and the only way to play those up to speed is you need to practice them really slowly on the metronome and gradually increase the BPMs until you're up to uh, where he was doing it on the record. And it's, it's very, it's a difficult piece, but it's a beautiful composition, Spanish Fly, and I think the fact that it sounds so good on the piano is an attestment to the composition that it translates over uh, whatever instrument. Well, for sure, the way you did it as well too, it would almost make one believe that it was that Eddie wrote it on piano first and took it to guitar because that's how well you did it. Oh well, thank you, but I mean, I don't want to take the credit. I, I think the credit really needs to go to to Eddie for the composition. And what's amazing, Eric, is that he wrote that song. I think he must have been 23 or 24 because, you know, you hear the story. He was playing it at a New Year's Eve party with Ted Templeman, and Ted Templeman goes, what's that, what's that? And and insisted that it went on Van Halen, too, because it was a way of silencing the critics, like whoever heard Eruption saying, oh, that's trickery. Let's hear him do that on an acoustic guitar or whatever. Well, here's Ed. He just picks it up and throws down, you know, Spanish Fly. And 24, even if he's 24, 25, it's fucking amazing. It certainly is. I'll tell you one thing that I really liked. Like, I like both compositions that you did, bo both covers. But what I thought was very, very cool was uh, at the very end of Mean Street, um, now, I don't know keyboard that well, but I know, you know, the different effects you can use, like with oscillation and um, pitch bend and stuff like that. So you almost duplicated the reverb and the feedback of his whammy bar, you know, feedbacking at the end. And um, I mean, it was if you close your eyes or if you weren't watching the video, you might think it's someone doing something on guitar. It sounds that much like it was a combination of pitch bend and oscillation and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I try to simulate a lot of the characteristics of the guitar on the keyboards, and I run through amps. I run through Marshalls, and and uh, I go through a lot of Van Halen pedals as well. I have my uh, Ed Van Halen Overdrive. I have the EVH Flanger, which is amazing. I have the EVH uh, Phase 90, and they're just... Uh, you know, it's a big part of my sound. I run my Nord Lead 3 through those pedals, and then I go through uh, my Marshall Plexi and a fourth wall. Yeah, and it's monstrous. It's really great. And on the Sons of Apollo record that I just did, a lot of uh, my Nord Leads and everything is going through that configuration. And you can hear the, the uh, Big Ed Flanger on, on certain spots of the record, and I always smile when I hear it. It's huge, of course. It's a huge part of my sound, and and uh, I'm going to be bringing them with me all over the world next year on the Sons of Apollo World Tour. Fantastic. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. And I know a lot of uh, EVH fans and the MXR, uh, Jim Dunlop fans, are going to be very happy to, to know that as well. Well, they've too. been very, Dunlop has been very supportive with me. Uh, George Tripps and Scott Uchida. I work with Scott. He's a great guy. Yeah, they've been very good to me, and... Um, George is a huge Van Halen fan as well. And so is Scott. They, they both are. 
So, yeah, it's great. Wicked. And Scott, if he if he happens to come uh, see some of your shows, he's an incredible photographer as well, too, so he might get some nice snaps for you. Oh, I know. He worked uh, – I met him when I was playing with Zach Wild on the Unblackened show. It was the acoustic – well, semi-acoustic. But Scott was – the photographer on that gig and that's where i met him he's a totally cool cat very nice guy and very talented in more ways than one let's talk a little bit about some van halen books um we're both obviously uh, fans of as much van halen content as we can consume so we've got van halen rising out there there's other books as well too i'm not saying these are the you know the end all be all but they're they're two of the popular ones van halen rising and noel monks running with the devil have you written or have you have you read either of the two and what were any of your takeaways from either of the two books i read both of them uh both are different, obviously from different perspectives. And I know Greg Renoff, I think he did a great job. Um, yeah, that you can you can tell that the amount of research that he did was uh, a lot. And so I think he did a really good job. So I took my time reading Van Halen Rising. Like I would read it like in segments and I kind of got distracted. But I'll say that the Noel Monk book, I got for the first time ever, I got a Kindle version because... I was traveling, and I really wanted to to uh, read that book on some of my long flights. So I purchased it. And I swear to God, I read that thing from beginning to end. Maybe I I uh, took one break to go to sleep, but it was almost like I woke up the next day. I got my Starbucks, and I just dug right back in to this book until I finished it. And yeah, that was pretty. Uh, that was very captivating. I, I love that book. I enjoyed that one a lot too, and I'm good friends with Greg Renoff as well too. And and I think his was probably the the, the more of the behind the scenes and the, the backyard party. They really focused on the you know well long before they were famous and signed and stuff like that. So I really enjoyed that. Uh, with Noel's book, I took that in on, on an audio book, and just because I didn't have not I did not have the time to sit and read. So when I was traveling, which is quite often, I would take in maybe a chapter in the car. And same thing as, as you. I didn't do it as fast as you, but I did consume it in one week, which was pretty good for an audio book. And um, yeah, it was it was really amazing. It's just you really get to be that uh, that fifth member of the band is kind of sitting in there as an observer and, and really getting, um, you know, the history and the things that we heard and rumors and all that kind of things. So it was it was a very cool experience. Both of their books love them to death. Yeah, that's great. I, I mean, I, I can't uh, read enough of that stuff, so I hope more come out. I think they probably will for sure. Let's uh, yeah. let, let's jump into some really cool sounds. Um, Eddie introduced us into some very interesting sounds in the Women and Children First album by taking his love of keyboards and the love of extremely loud marshals and mixing them together. Tell us a little bit about your approach to that running your various keyboards into marshals or marshall style amplifiers. Well, I was I was very inspired by that record and the Cradle Will Rock. He's running his Wurlitzer 200A through. Uh, his Marshall Plexi and 412, and it sounds like he's going through his MXR flanger as well. And it's just, it's killer sounding, man. The overtones that come out of that instrument. It, what's really interesting is that at school, in junior high, in the band, they had that exact same keyboard, the Wurlitzer 200A. And if you play the low fifth, it sounds, you can hear there's a little bit of a growl, like a distortion growl that comes out on that instrument naturally through the speakers. So then if you bypass the internal speakers and crank it through a Marshall Plexi, it's fucking monstrous. And you hear all the overtones coming out, and that's how he gets that sound on on Cradle. And what's bitching is that he does one side where he's playing the Wurlitzer through the Marshalls, which everyone thinks is the guitar, but it's just it's a little different and cool. And then he overdubs his real guitar along with it. And so you get this really unique killer blend between the two instruments. And if you listen to the song Coming Home on, on Sons of Apollo, the whole breakdown session that sounds like the Who, that's a Wurlitzer going through the Marshall. It's the same configuration as uh, Eddie on on Cradle Will Rock, so it's totally inspired by that. And the part I'm doing, even though it's kind of like the who, it's also very inspired by little guitars, that kind of technique. So what I like about this, there is a lot, uh, not just one, not two, but there are many nods to Eddie Van Halen on this record. I, I, I have kind of goosebumps as I'm speaking to you about it because, you know, we both we both love the man. Um, the fact that there is Eddie Van Halen uh, inspiration throughout this record is uh, one reason alone just to buy the record. Well... You know, he's been such a huge... I mean, I don't know if you're aware. I, my son is named Halen. Yes. I named him after Ed. 
the little hail and we, I mean, Eddie is everywhere. And it comes down to who did you have on your wall when you were a kid? And I had Van Halen, I had Brandy, I had Ingve. And to this day in my studio, I still have Van Halen on my wall because when I record, I want to look at him to remind me why I'm doing this in the first place and the standard of how excellent of excellence that I want to play at. And so that's the bar. I feel like he's looking down, he's like he's looking down on my shoulder. Yeah, exactly. It giving you a little nod. And you did tell me once before about your son, um, Halen. And for the longest time as a kid, I joke about this sometimes on the show, I had a poster as a kid. It came from one of these magazines, whatever. It could have been Circus or Cream, whatever. And it was um, a centerfold, actually a four-page foldout. It was David Lee Roth that said Van Halen. And I didn't really know the band that much, but he looked really cool. And I was like, this Van guy is kind of quirky. He's really weird, thinking that was his name, <laughs> Mr. Van Halen, or like Van Morrison, right? Like Van. So that's how yeah, I Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did too because I have a cousin named Van. So when I saw Van Halen, I thought that was the guy's name was Van, and then the last name was Halen. And then I saw the uh, credits on the inside, and it said Alex Van Halen. I go, oh, okay, that's the, the surname. So we we both kind of felt silly for a while. We don't tell too many people, but it's okay. We're in good company, so people won't be too hard on us. No, it's all good. Here, uh, here's something I wanted to talk about that's very cool. Um, you were able to perform and hang with Eddie some years back at his own private function. Even though that you're a virtuoso musician, I bet you felt like the young Derek, the Van Halen fan at the same time. I'm here jamming with Eddie Van Halen. Um, but uh, tell, tell us what that whole experience was like. Well, it was absolutely surreal. And I, it was 2006, and I'll tell you exactly, it was like September 29th or 30th, because just seven or eight days earlier, my daughter Summer was born, and that was like a heavy experience having uh, my daughter. And then my friend Stefan played in this Hollywood band called the Starfuckers, and they played like on the Sunset Strip every Tuesday or whatever. So for some reason, Eddie's wife to be Jane saw the Starfuckers playing and said, "I want this band to play at at Ed's party." Well, Ed just did soundtrack for some uh, porn director and they decided to have a huge party up at the Van Halen house up at 5150 up on uh, Coldwater and so anyhow the Starfuckers were hired to play this show and my friend Stefan knows how much I was into Van Halen so he goes you know Sherinian you gotta do this gig and we're playing at Van Halen's house and I go no way and so I was on the gig. I'm totally excited. So we get there the day before, and I was playing with Billy Idol at the time. Mm-hmm. And Billy was going to do the gig as well. So we show up, and then boom, there's fucking Ed. And it was just, it was very surreal. And I played with a lot of big stars in my career, and I'm constantly around that shit. But when I was around him, it was just like a different level of uh, Starstruck. I, I turned into a fan, but I, I, I had to like keep my cool. I'm like going to be playing with this guy. Mm-hmm. He then said, I want to play too. And then so it was like, oh my God, this just turned into even a cooler thing. So this day before, there's people like scrambling around or whatever. I don't know what compelled me, but I went up to him and I said, hey, Ed, I go, can you take us up to the studio and, and show us? And he goes, yeah, come on. And so me and the drummer, Brian Tishy, my friend, who's mm-hmm. also been with me and Billy Idol at the time, we, the three of us, go up from where the main house is, and then you have to go up like this path or whatever. And then the guest house is what's converted into 5150. And so we walk into the studio, and I, I look in the control room, and on the wall is hanging all these guitars. There's the shark guitar on Women and Children First and all these other uh, guitars that I've seen since I was a kid in, in magazines and I was just going, holy fuck, this is insane. And and then he took us through the rest of the, the uh, studio and Alex's drums were there and they're all mic'd up and then you can see the vault with all of the 24-track tapes and two-inch tapes of unreleased stuff and it was just amazing and Ed was telling stories. It seemed like uh, two hours we were up there but I bet in reality it was probably like 45 minutes it was insane, and he's telling us stories. Then we played and rehearsed, and then the next day we did the gig. And there's some footage of it on YouTube. There's like two or three of the songs that we played, so it's documented. And it was just, uh, it was definitely a bucket list moment, you know? It was really, 
really fucking cool. I, I can't. I can only imagine what it'd be like. I mean, it's it's one thing, like you say, you you're around celebrities all the time, and with some of the world's greatest musicians, you have a handful of them in your band right now. Uh, however, they, you know, being in the same presence of Eddie Van Halen is one thing, and that's kind of hard to get your composure and and have a you know a legible conversation and not sound like you know super fan. But to be able to play with them and be respected by him as well, because obviously he was happy uh, to have you there. Um, it says a lot about yourself, but just just living in that moment. I know that's something that you'll never ever forget for the rest of your life. No, definitely not. That was a killer moment. But a little other side note is uh, Women and Children First. That was my very first concert. You said that was the first record you got. Uh, not the first record I got. The first time I heard them actually was my cousin's record. They played in the Cradle of Rock, and that's oh, how I discovered. First, yeah, yeah. The first time you heard was Women and Children First. Well, the first concert I went to was Women and Children First, 1980. And the opening band, Callis, Billy Sheehan on bass. Oh, fantastic. Yes, yes. So he's the first rock concert I ever was at. The very first band I saw was the opening band for Van Halen Callis with Billy. And now I'm playing in a band with him. Uh, fuck, how many years is that? 37 years later. That's crazy. And you have him in your band. And Billy is a huge Van Halen fan, as we all know as well, too. Oh, and he tells stories about being on that tour and he told the story he was almost uh, at one point they were betting him to possibly be in Van Halen and it's a true story he told me all about it and I believe him I heard I heard rumors on that on that subject as well too and I just think I think it probably it, I love Billy to death I, love, I mean I worship the grounding rocks on As a matter of fact I talked to him today he wants to come on the show as well too to talk some Van Halen but I don't think it would have worked it overall because, um, and it's no disrespect to Eddie and it's no disrespect to Billy. It's just, I don't think, see, Billy, I think, really worked really well with Steve Vai uh, and David Lee Roth because it was a trade-off back and forth. I think in Van yeah. Halen, I think Mike just, the way Mike uh, just holds the pocket, and I, Billy can do it, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that. But Mike and Alex just hold that pocket where Eddie does his thing. I think maybe in the in the long term, if you're looking back in hindsight, it probably um, was for the better that he didn't join the band. But I mean, it would have been a cool opportunity for him, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, I, I agree with everything that you said. I think the best lineup is the original lineup because there's a chemistry between the four of them, and it's you know rare. You can get great players together, but there might not be that magical energy between them, and it's definitely in Van Halen and and. Michael Anthony, his playing is solid enough. He feeds Eddie. He doesn't get in his way. But then he's got that killer background vocal, which is a huge part of the identity of the Van Halen sound. And you just can't ignore that. You can't like pretend that that's not there. So exactly, I've said it many times in the show. Like, there's not just there's more, so many voices, and there's obviously Eddie's guitar. You think of Alex. When I think of Alex, I think of his snare. Before I think of anything else, I think of his snare. It's a voice. Michael Anthony, I know his bass is just in the pocket, but that voice is is so so important to Van Halen. And um, you know, Wolfgang's doing a great job, a, a very commendable job, incredible job. But we, I think, we do all miss that harmony that Mike could do. Was he a lead singer? No, but he certainly had that range. But when we get a little uh, deeper into the interview tonight as well, talking about um, Sons of Apollo, we're going to flip the coin back on Billy there. We're going to say how someone Billy is a uh, virtuoso as he is, he holds that pocket. Uh, like on the, one of the tracks I'm going to comment on shortly, I won't give it away yet, but one of the tracks that I love the most on the record, Billy has room to go crazy, yet he has restraint. And that takes a lot of, um, that. well, it takes restraint and it takes a lot of discipline to know when not to play. Yeah, well, Billy, I'll say this, when we were putting this band together, Billy was the only choice for bass because we knew that we we're thinking who in the hell else do you get to uh, to play bass in this band that's going to be able to cover all the lines and, and play aggressively and and you know be able to keep up and he's probably the only guy a couple other guys might be able to do it but billy's the guy man who else are you going to get I know. And the fact, too, like there's that little camaraderie and a little bit of a common thread uh, between you and him with the Van Halen influence and everything of the nature. So that that's a nice feather in the cap as well. Oh, yeah. He's a he's a great guy. And he's definitely the, the veteran. That guy's been doing it longer than all of us. And uh, he's just very easy to work with and great player. I love Billy Sheehan. The, the world does as well, too. And let's talk a little bit more further about Van Halen. When we'd mentioned Michael Anthony and things of the sort, do you think we'll see a Van Halen reunion uh, next year? And what are your thoughts on it? What, how it could potentially go down? Do you think we'll see a Sammy and Mike back or a Dave and Mike back or a combo of all the above? I, I don't know. Honestly, my opinion, it, it doesn't matter. I think Edward should be able to do whatever he wants to do. 
and I think that's killer. To me, if it was my call, I think that uh, some things are better left to memory, and I would just rather have Eddie do something fresh and different. Very cool. I, I like that. But I would like to see it, and that's just my honest opinion, and I feel I'm entitled to say that because of my uh, Van Halen pedigree and longevity of loving the band mm -hmm. as much as I do. I love them that much that I would, would love to see them uh, maybe not play. There you go. And the cool thing is, I think the, the one thing we can take away from this is the fact that, you know, we all uh, follow Eddie very closely um, through the media, social media especially. Um, you know, he's been a little bit more active, whether it's him or, or Janie or, or whoever's ever running the accounts. Um, but we're seeing a very happy and healthy Eddie, which is, um, it makes a lot of us smile. And yourself as a fan saying, you know, you could just live with the memories. Well, the nice thing is we get to see him happy, smiling out there in public, doing some, you know, uh, community things and charity uh, functions and just having fun, even being a kid again, you know, racing with his brother, you know, on the, on the track, uh, you know, firing off yeah. weapons on the shooting range and stuff like that. Even that alone, if we can have music, I know I'm, I'm a little selfish. I would like some music, but at the same time, they don't owe us anything thing and i'm just happy to see him smile when i see him smile it's kind of a nice feel-good moment too so um who knows um we'll talk about wolf 100 percent. and i and i want to say this back to my my previous statement i was there at the very final van halen show at hollywood bowl and i was in the front you could not buy a better seat than where i was sitting i was front row center i'll text you the picture after this just so you can see where i was sitting on this thing and I was very pleased to see how great Eddie played. And he was going through his routines and he was smiling, like you said, and his energy was amazing. And I really got up on seeing him play. I just feel that as a whole, the mighty Van Halen that we know and love is just a different thing now. And I just, I loved the memory of the old. I, I love that and I will look forward to seeing that picture but that's the thing too I mean I was talking about this the other day with, with family here talking about some movies we were comparing some movies that we like like the Breaking Bads uh, I love The Walking Dead and, and things like that and, you know, you talk about shows running on for eternity and eternity and eternity. And Breaking Bad went out after seven seven seasons, I think it was. And, you know, could they have gone to 10, whatever, or 12, whatever? It's really nice to go out on a really high note. And, and if we're talking about uh, TV shows, um, Breaking Bad, I don't think it could have ended on a better note. I, th I think the, the last tour um, with Van Halen was phenomenal. Uh, the, you know, people will criticize till the cows come home about Dave's voice and things like that. You know, Dave is still leading the ringleader of that band. Did a phenomenal job. You can criticize him till the cows come home, but he's still David Lee Roth and led that band on a phenomenal tour, a phenomenal record. So if it was there's nothing to come out as a new record or new tour or anything like that, I think we've all been given a real blessing. Better to have a high note than go out, uh, you know, on a nostalgia tour just for money, just to, just to please the fans. You agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, I thought Edward played great. I thought it was really cool. If it was the last time I was ever to see him play live, I'm glad that he sounded as great as he did. Perfect. Good good way to good takeaway from that one for sure. Something you'll remember your last concert seeing Van Halen, if it was the case, if it was the case, uh, emphasize if, uh, then it was a good memory for you. We talk about uh, the vocals with, um, you know, background vocals with Michael Anthony. Now, you know, Wolfgang is handling the bass duties and the background vocals doing a very commendable job. That kid is going to be, I, I peg him as going to be one of the next guitar heroes and virtuosos and many, many instruments. Have you been following his progress on the upcoming solo album? Or what do you think the future holds for him? I haven't heard his new solo records, but I heard his tribute to um, when he played Eruption to honor it. I think it was 40 years or whatever, and, and it was beautiful how perfect he played it and his attention to detail. And, and he's a monster. I remember when I did that Van Halen gig up at his house, Eddie was playing VHS cassettes of the Alex, Wolf, and Eddie rehearsing the songs because they knew they were going to be getting ready to play with Rock. So they were going through the stuff, and he was playing us the videos. And, you know, you can hear, great, he's got it. I mean, fuck, how can you be born to Eddie Van Halen and not have it? That would be really weird. That's right. You know, you know my favorite yeah. part of that, my, and this might sound silly, but I, I, it's from the heart. Here's what I love about that performance where he did And, you know, his Uncle Pat, uh, Bertinelli, recorded that in the studio. Um, what I love about that is not his performance. His performance was brilliant, bang on. But watch the very, very last second. I actually have the video up on, on my YouTube as well, too. 
And you look at him when he, he looks up, he's smiling. He's just got this grin bigger than David Lee Ross grin. And I don't think he was grinning because look, I'm playing eruption. Number one, I played my dad's famous piece and I, and you know what? I'm so proud of my dad. That's what I took out of that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, honestly, this is uh, Billy, Billy Sheehan was our first and only choice for Sons of Apollo. But as a backup, if, if Billy was not available for us and didn't want to play, one of the names that that came up was Wolf Van Halen. No way. No, it, it, it's true. But not, all I'm saying is Billy was obviously our first and only choice. So we didn't know if he was going to uh, play this. We didn't want to assume anything. So we, we had a... Uh, you know, plan B, plan C. So his name was definitely on there. Has that been discussed much before? No, never before. You okay if I hear that? Sure. Here's a staple question, and it's and I know we talked about Van Halen the very first album. That's how you uh, you discovered Van Halen. Well, this could be the answer to the question, but not necessarily. What is your va- your favorite Van Halen album, and why? Wow, it changes, and it's really hard to say. But I think Fair Warning uh, to me is just fucking awesome and it totally kicks ass and it's different than the other ones i love that there's no cover songs on it and eddie's playing is just fierce that's the album where he really started tapping into the holdsworth he did on the women and children a little bit i think at that point he heard holdsworth in the dead of night solo and i think that that profoundly changed ed he started hearing all the fluid legato up for his interpretation of when he started doing like on the out solo of Drop Dead Legs, how you hear that on 1984. But mm-hmm. if you listen to like on uh, Center Swing, that solo, the way when he's playing like that, that's all Alan Holdsworth's face. I agree. And it's funny, I've been consuming so many interviews of yours with other uh, great you know media outlets, and I see, just so I could be prepared for the interview with you tonight, and I see you bring up that name a lot. So obviously there's a bit of uh, a bit of uh, an influence, or I, you have a love for Alan Holtzworth as well, too. Well, the only reason why, in the beginning, is because I'd read every single Eddie Van Halen interview that came out, and then Eddie all of a sudden started talking uh, around in 1980, 81, 82, I for, you know, forgot what year, but he starts talking about Alan Holdsworth and how this guy is the most amazing guitarist he's ever heard. So as a, uh, you know, 14, 15 year old kid, who's totally immersed in, in playing. I went out and bought everything possible at Alan Holdsworth. If Ed says he's fucking the best he's ever heard, then he's got to be great. Right. Exactly. So I went in and got everything and started listening. And I said, ah, now I see where Ed is getting this. And it forced Ed for the first time to uh, think outside of his comfort zone and his go-to licks. Like if he had Van Halen 1 and Van Halen 2 behind him. And uh, I really think it, it surfaced on Fair Warning, not so much women and children. I think Fair Warning, there was a shift in his playing. And I think a lot of it was the Holtzworthian influence and his technique uh, went up a notch. I feel it. I think you're 100% accurate on that, for sure. It's almost like a, um, I describe his playing on that record, almost like a race car weaving. You know how, you know how, uh, you know, the, the, the stock cars, NASCARs will warm up their cars, where their tires while they're getting on the track, like weaving in and out, getting warmed up, whatever. And just when you least expect it, there's just a, a huge acceleration and then back to it again. Uh, it's all over the map. But it's phenomenal. It's totally controlled, but on the edge of control, if that makes any sense. Uh, edge of out of control. Yeah, I think that's a good analogy. And I have a friend that was an engineer yeah, on that session. He was like a second engineer. And then later on, he worked for a Warner Brothers and, and did digital restoring of the masters or whatever. But a lot of people don't know this. But there was a lot of tension between Ted Templeman and Ed on that record, mm-hmm. where Ted Templeman was trying to get Ed to evidently do a lot of overdubs, and and Ed, no, Ed, Ed was trying to overdub a lot more, and he did on Fair Warning. You can hear a lot more overdubs, but Ed wanted to do even more, and Ted Templeman's would know part of the magic of the sound is when you take a solo and the rhythm guitar drops out and it's just Alex and Michael feeding you under the solo. That's what gives it like a jazz quartet or trio feel. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, Unchained, one of the takes that I heard, there's like a rhythm guitar 
an additional guitar going on underneath the verses. Like a gun gun. Okay. Gun, gun, gun. Over and underneath it, down, down, down. There's like a secondary part going on, and it's like it it sounds heavy as fuck, but it's not the same. No, and it wouldn't God be. They took that out. Yeah, thank God they took that out. But there's some other uh, takes out there, very rare, that you don't hear on the uh, the internet. Only very few people have heard this stuff. What I, what I think is really funny is the fact that we, you know, I, I love to, I respect Ted Tupman for what he provided uh, for the first few records there. But Ted Tupman is almost the, the creator of the monster because, you know, Eddie didn't even know what overdubbing was. And and Ted's like, okay, you, I need you to do this. So come a few, four records later, Eddie wants to do more. And now Ted's mad at him. My favorite part of the Renoff book of uh, Van Halen Rising was when he starts talking about the Ted Templeman chapter and when Ted Templeman describes hearing uh, Van Eddie for the first time that he was moved in such a way like he was watching someone like Charlie Parker or someone amazing he knew that there was greatness there and he jumped all over it and he made that deal happen he pushed it through and he was smart enough to know to get those guys in the studio and just capture the rawness and thank God the band was so tight from doing all those club shows that they just, you could stick them in the studio and, and they could blow through 20 songs in a day. I know. You know what I mean? Because they just, it's like playing a club show, like playing a set or playing two sets or whatever. And so they were just so tight and, and dialed in and Ted Templeman captured it. It's just it's fucking awesome. And the same thing in Noel's book. Noel himself too. He wanted to work with Van Halen. He, no matter what it, what it took, wanted to work with Van Halen solely on Eddie. The rest came as icing on the cake. But when he heard Eddie play for the first time, you know, I have to work with this band. And then Ted Templeman signed the band based on just Eddie. And he goes, you know what? We'll make the rest of it work. This guy <laughs> is so amazing that uh, that uh, <laughs> we'll make it work. And that's what he did. That's right. Another reference to, to Noel's book, you know, people were saying they heard this this Van Halen kid, he's playing, he's up there with Hendrix and stuff like that. And that was such a bold statement to make back in that day. Like, I mean, how dare you put Jimi Hendrix in a sentence and put this Van Halen kid in a sentence? Hey, I will. I know. I'll be every day. And, uh, you know, you can't, it's apples and oranges. Hendrix saying Hendrix also was a cultural icon for, for you know, the Vietnam and playing the national anthem and and all the civil rights movements and all that. So it's kind of hard to fuck with the impact of something like that. But if you want to strip away all the other the vocals and the civil rights stuff and you just want to talk guitar, let's hear Hendrix play Spanish Fly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's hear him play, let's hear him play Eruption. Yep, two, two different beats for sure. But it certainly was nice, uh, you know, that Eddie earned that spot with an icon like that. And then, you know, look where he went from there. But you know what? We've had some great, great discussion on Van Halen. And I, I feel I feel horrible if we don't talk about uh, the fantastic new record that you've got up. So you were kind enough to lend uh, lend me a um, advanced screening copy of the new record. So I've listened to Psychotic Symphony in its entirety. And being a listener to not as much prog as the next guy, I instantly gravitated to the track Coming Home. We talked a little bit earlier that in the in the interview tonight. I found that song to have balls from hell and, in my opinion, quite possibly one of the best rock songs recorded in 2017. I, I find that there's so much talent in the band, uh, but at the same time, no one seems to step on any toes or out to prove anything. I think it just kind of works. Tell us about the song, its timeline in the album's writing process, and how it all came together. Well, the song, uh, thank you, I'm glad that you like it. it it's a lot of people are really digging it. It's been a really good response on, on YouTube. I think it's like at 650,000 views in a month. It's which insane. Is really, really good. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a buzz about the band, and people are checking it out. That song in particular uh, is a, a riff that I wrote on the opening, and then Bumblefoot came in with the, the main guitar riff, that's the verse and the chorus, and then uh, the whole who section I wrote. And then he goes back to the main riff. It's not really that complex of a song. There's like three sections. But it rocks, man. It's definitely cool. That whole breakdown section is very Van Halen influenced because there's the Cradle of Rock sound on the World of Sir, like I was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. And the whole little guitars thing, which is, I think, Eddie, that little guitars uh, technique is maybe influenced by The Who or Angus or. I like it. But, I. I might be reading way too much into it, but is the song at all a metaphor for, for each of you guys kind of finding your little comfort uh, comfort zone in music right now, or is it, am I reading way too much into that? 
Well, no, maybe I think a little bit. I think the coming home, a lot of it, Mike Portnoy has been out of progressive metal for like the last seven years. And I have too, since the Dream Theater, I haven't been playing uh, this style at all. And so now here we are reunited, reunited 20 years later, and it's like we're coming home to, uh, to play in that style of music again. But I'll say this about Sons of Apollo. When Mike and I first decided to go forward with this, on paper, we figured that the band was going to be more progressive metal. But once we started writing and bringing Bumblefoot in the mix, all of our classic rock and hard rock influences really came to the forefront, so much to the point that all the the virtuosity came as icing on the cake. And we just strategically uh, put that stuff in, like in the solo sections and in the middle sections, but all the places where there's vocals, it's pretty straightforward and singable and listenable, straight ahead rock, but the middle sections is the wild, wild west. Anything goes. I love it. And it's not a sellout by any means. It's what came naturally with the, the talent that you have in the band. And it's the uh, stuff we like to listen to. We love we love it. You know, Van Halen, A C D C Aerosmith, Queen, Zeppelin, you know, all the greats. And we get inspired by all of them and we try to incorporate all of the sounds and feels that we love growing up and throw it into the stew anything goes and then on top of that we can throw in all the the, uh, crazy instrumental stuff and it's really a lot of flexibility in Sons of Apollo because if you look at it man for man pound for pound there really isn't a sicker lineup as far as players it's heavyweight I agreed it's a heavy it's a heavyweight juggernaut there's no doubt about that it's it's like the Marvel superheroes it's like each player is like a superhero on their instrument with a signature style and sound. And when we come together, we know to play off of each other's strengths and, and make sure that everyone's featured at the, the right time and no one's stepping on each other's toes. And it's just a real, it's a juggernaut, just like you said. What I think is going to be great, and I'm looking forward to next year, 2018, it's just on around the corner. I'm looking forward to see what kind of improv can come out during live uh, the tour. I have a feeling there's going to be some amazing, amazing improv, and I, I know we're, we're putting the cart way before the horse. But with the talent that you guys have, I know nothing is going to be stock, and I think we're all going to be in for a treat. But we'll talk about what's coming next as we get a little further down. Uh, so I'm glad I was a little bit somewhat on, on the right page as far as the metaphor. Here's a question from a longtime drummer friend of mine, and he's a huge fan of yours and Mike's. He's, he, he worships Mike Portnoy. Uh, Jeff Azar is his name. He's re- recorded with me before and toured with me. Um, he asked, is the writing process with Mike the same, and is the chemistry still the same between the two of you? Yeah, uh, Mike and I have always had a strong personal and musical chemistry. So when we got back together and played uh, in 2012 for the PSMS with Billy Sheen and Tony McAlpine, it was like a day had it passed. And we just have both common passion for music and, you know, love to, to make great, you know, songs and productions. And the only way that the dynamic really changed is back then, I was joining an established band, so I was trying to, you know, find my way into the machine. This, we're both, you know, equal partners starting from the ground up. That, to me, it's much more joyous and pleasurable to work with Mike in this capacity than before. It's almost like building a foundation for a new office building, and uh, instead of walking in there and putting up your own wallpaper, you're actually planning out the blueprints here. You're pouring the cement, the whole works. percent And in this band, I'm the, uh, the, one of the main songwriters, and also I co-produce the records, and so I didn't have that kind of creative control before. Oh, I, I love that. Uh, I, did, I, I knew that you did some, some serious writing, but I didn't know you co-produced it. That was my next question I was going to ask you. Um, one of the, the one of the tracks is actually one of the biggest ones, and it's, it kicks off the record right off the right off the hop. Is "God of the Sun" that was written and conceptualized solely by you? Um, describe how that one come from one of your many ideas in your head to bringing it to the band as a as a kickoff track. Oh well, when Mike and I started, uh, when we decided to pull the trigger on Sons of Apollo, I started writing, and it was probably about a year ago. And I just started demoing ideas and sections, and one of the things I stumbled on was this God of the Sun. And I started just building it and building it. By the time I finished with it, it ended up like into a trilogy, uh, totaling a little bit like 11 or 12 minutes or whatever. And so I sent it to Mike in a really raw form of the demo. It's just my keyboards playing along with a click. 
there's no drums or no guitar or bass or anything. It's just keyboard playing with a click. And I sent this 12-minute piece to, to Portnoy, and he right away said, he goes, this is amazing. Let's, let's leave it as it is. It's perfect. And he goes, this is going to be the album opener. And I go, whoa, wait a minute. I go, I'm glad you like it. I go, but, you know, the whole album isn't written yet. How do you know? He goes, I just know this is going to be the opener. And here we are. It ends up. Uh, God of the Sun opening Psychotic Symphony and so I was really happy about that and it totally inspired me to just to keep writing and writing and writing so by the time we got to the studio like three months later I had a militia of riffs and ideas and then so did Bumblefoot he had some really killer stuff too and so we just threw it all in the stew and, and whatever resonated with us as a, a unit we would just finish up the musical composition of it and that's how we did it and then the phase two was with the vocals with Jeff Scott Soto uh, and Mike and I we all got together and really you know set a very high standard for the vocal because we thought that the music that we did was fantastic and the vocals had to be on par or better of and course so we worked with, with the melody lines and Jeff just fucking kicked ass and did a great job in the writing his voice is just very strong and very listenable it doesn't have any of the the uh, cheesy cliches of prog rock like the high oh no no or the fake anchor like i'm mad at the world or no cookie monster vocals it's just really uh powerful and heavy you know there's there's a lot of singers that probably could have come to the plate and hit a double or a triple but i i really do think jeff uh he he hit grand slam with it with that record you you said it totally uh no cliches um, he owned it. He he totally owned it. It, it just takes uh, 15 minutes. It takes five minutes of listening um, to know right up right off the get go that he owns it. And like you said, the music already right. spoke. So those vocals have to shine. It's not going to be. You just can't sprinkle on something to get by. They have to surpass. No, no, they had to be. They had to be great. I was really adamant about it. And um, yeah, you know, Jeff he kicked ass, and he's going to be able to. Uh, sell it live. He's a great frontman live and a uh, super nice guy too. So we're very pleased with that. Fantastic. And you both work with some of the same musicians with Ingve and, and, and more as well too. Let's, let's talk, it seems how you talk about some of these fellows. You've had a long time relationship with Mike, uh, both professional and personal. How would you describe your relationship with the, your new partners, Billy, Jeff, and, and Ron? I think it's great. I just met Ron for the first time, the first day of the recording the record. And so I just saw a connection with him right away when I heard him play. I go, fuck, this guy's amazing. It was like a long-lost brother. And so making the record was especially a pleasure because it was just a fresh vibe, and he was just so good. Billy Sheehan I've known for a long time, and so uh, I feel very comfortable with him and great. And Jeff Scott Soto I've known throughout the years but never spent a lot of time with him, and I think he's a really uh, cool guy and, and total pro. And I'm just really blessed to be surrounded with this lineup. I think these guys are great. And they sound great on record. They're going to kick ass live. And I think that we uh, have a big future together. And I think this is a really good thing for all of us. Sun from Apollo has the most potential to generate the most heat out of all of the bands and projects that we've worked in in the past. So we're, we're very grateful to have each other and, and this band and our record that's coming out on Friday. I'm very happy for all of you. I'm very happy for you, but I'm happy for the whole band. And I can hear the passion in your voice. Um, I mean, you're not selling me. I, I can hear it and I can feel it. And I'm just very, very anxious. Obviously, I've been spoiled because I've been listening to the record, but I'm very anxious for people to get this record in their hands or their iPods or their physical their physical hands. Is this, I, actually, here's the question. Is it coming on vinyl too, by chance? Oh, yes, it is. It's in like five different versions of vinyl. And so you can check out on sonsofapollo.com or also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. There's constant updates with everything, uh, our tour movements on, on everything. Yeah, upcoming videos. Great. I, I will make sure I put every single link to every entity to get the album, the vinyl I mentioned, uh, tour dates, everything like that in the description of the video when I make this a video and put it up on YouTube. So I'll make sure everyone can be led by the hand uh, to get this thing for sure. Let's jump into your, you just got back from a, a jam-packed uh, press junket over to uh, Europe. And uh, I, I saw your daily itineraries. I mean, it was literally separated by five minutes from all these different organizations that were interviewing you and Mike. Uh, how were you and Mike received overseas? Oh, it was great. I mean, it was just the journalists, so it wasn't fans. But I'll say, so out of we probably did close to 
four or five hundred videos or um, interviews in total, whether they're phoners or face to faces. And the reception has been amazing from everyone. Everyone loves the record. Everyone's excited. You can see it in their eyes and you can hear, you know, the passion in their voice as well. And it's just universal that they love the record. There it is, man. If you have a fucking good record, people are going to know and people will come out to the shows. And that's just it. I mean, I don't have to sit here and sell it. With all these interviews, it's just like, you know what? Listen to it. It's going to sell itself. That's right. And you, and you can you can tell someone when they're, when they're out there selling, like I just said just a moment ago, the passion. I can hear it in your voice and the fans will the fans will see it. They'll watch the videos. They'll listen to the singles. Uh, they're going to be able to get the album in a couple of days. And then fortunately, in the near new uh, new year, we'll get to go see it on the live stage and then we'll see it for sure. My last question for you for the evening is um, the industry labels Sons of Apollo as a super group, but I have a feeling you don't, you guys yourselves don't necessarily look at that way. Share with your thoughts on how you look at your bandmates and what fans can expect from the five of you. I, I think when I, I think super group is a, from a perspective, I think from most people, I guess would consider us a super group. From my perspective, I mean, I, I would think that Jimmy Page, a Geezer Butler, or, you know, all of those guys, that's a super group to me. But I think that we we uh, are a form of one. Yeah, you you have to say it because we all have such a strong pedigree. We have an octopus pedigree. Uh, you, you have to put more arms on in order to list all of our credits. I mean, it's pretty insane. So, yeah, I guess you have to call it a super group. Super musicians, super talented super humble and super good guys that's what i find from all of you guys and i think that's another reason one of the many many ingredients in this uh, massive recipe that works you, you said you talked about stirring it all in the pot it all works it's, it's just uh, it's a great combination i think it's a nice treat there's not a lot of music that's out there today um that's fresh than new that really turns heads um, I, I, I think you can kind of count on a, on a couple fingers or at least a hand of things that make you go, what? And I think this is one of them for sure. And uh, I'm going to keep going back. I, I don't want to just pigeonhole coming home. Um, but that song, it, that goosebump moment as a kid, you know, you get that when you hear Van Halen or you hear whatever. It's just one of those things. Yeah. The panoramic uh, 360 view of the video, I mean, it might make you dizzy, but even reminds me as a kid being on one of those, you know, twirl of world things when music was cool and I'm getting, I'm almost getting dizzy and nauseous because I'm being spun around so fast. It's just so many things are bring you back to your childhood. And it's, it's, it's a great record, great people. I'm really looking forward to see what 2018 and beyond holds for all five of you guys. Great, Eric. Thank you so much for taking the time and for this interview. And please send links and I'll uh, post away. I will gladly do that for sure. Thanks so much, Derek. All right, Eric. Have a good night. Thank you very much.